Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, with NAF. We're, uh, uh, I think, one of the UK's largest think tanks, uh, and we're increasingly looking at this issue of money, how it works in the economy, how banks really operate rather than how th people think they operate. We think it's absolutely at the core of all of the problems that we face, whether that's inequality, <coughs> environmental degradation, um, social justice, well-being. It's at the heart of it. And that's why we decided to write this book. Um, and Positive Money gave us a lot of support with the writing of this, this book, as did um, these two men, smart-looking men. Um, professor Richard Werner, some of you may know of. He's um, Professor of uh, Banking and Finance at the University of, of Southampton has set up a centre down there uh, to look at this area. Um, he's an extremely um, talented macroeconomist. He's been trained in orthodox economics and he's spent the rest of his life destroying it, ripping it to pieces uh, for its <coughs> failure to incorporate money into how and credit and, and how, how that affects the, the real economy. He's written two best-selling books. He was uh, working in Japan during the 1990s, saw the debt deflation, coined the term quantitative easing, and then watched the Bank of Japan implement the t uh, quantitative easing in precisely the way he'd asked them, he'd advised them not to. Um, and he's now watching the UK and much of Europe do, do quite similarly. We also had help from this esteemed institution, the Bank of England. We had a mole in the Bank of England who... Uh, uh, helped us all the way through, read various um, editions, commented. Um, so the Bank of England's been through this, this book. Um, and, um, you know, take it from me, um, they've, they've helped us out. Um, and they're, they're quite sympathetic to, to, to what we're, we're talking about here. Um, and the final person who, who helped us was, was Charles Goodhart, who, who's already been mentioned, is probably in the top three most prestigious monetary economists in the UK. Um, and uh, is a, one of the main reasons that a, a lot of serious uh, MPs and, and, and serious po uh, policy makers are, are going to read this book because his name, he's written the, uh, the forward on the front. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of try and take you through something that is extremely difficult to explain and um, you're kind of a, a test run for me so forgive me if um, things are not clear. I think the best thing is if I try and run through it and then take questions afterwards, because if I go all the way through it, a lot of the questions that will immediately jump up at you might be answered by the end, and we've got very limited time. So if you forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to try and run through it. The way I'm going to sort of frame this um, is to talk about six kind of myths around how banks and money actually works, um, and then basically try and tell you how things really work. The first myth... Um, is, uh, which I hope you, you know is a myth, is that banks essentially, their essential function is, is as intermediaries. Um, now, banks do play an intermediary function. If you uh, have a savings account, a, you know, a time deposit, that money is recycled um, to other parts of the economy. But this idea that that's the main thing that banks do <coughs> is wrong, okay? Um, banks do not that their primary economic function is not as an intermediary just recycling our savings, as this kind of diagram shows. Um, banks are creators of credit. They create brand new purchasing power. Okay? Um, this, is, this is how they do it, essentially. They make a loan, let's say a loan to Robert uh, uh, of £10,000. Okay? Banks use double entry bookkeeping. Those of you who are accountants, any accountants in the audience? Hands up. <laughs> <laughs> Hands up, come on, don't be afraid. Okay. <laughs> so we've got about four or five accountants. You guys will understand this, I hope, more quickly than, than, than a lot of people, and I advise you to get into this subject. But essentially, when a bank creates a loan, uh, it creates both an asset, which is the loan, and it creates a liability at the same time, at exactly the same time. The liability is the deposit. A deposit is money. You can use it to pay your taxes. You can pay your taxes to the government with an IOU created by a bank, a liability. And everyone else in the economy will accept that deposit, that IOU, because everyone knows they can pay their taxes with it. It's that simple, right? That is money, okay? And the bank doesn't need 
anyone else's deposits to create that deposit. Okay? It's just created that £10,000 um, by typing a, a number into a computer on the basis, mainly, of its confidence that you'll pay back that loan. And in some cases, not on the basis of <laughs> its confidence that you'll pay back that loan because it's packaged up that loan, securitized it, um, and sold it on to somebody else to take the responsibility of paying back the loan. And that's, what this, um, that's why this securitization problem is, is such a big issue as well. So there's a quote there from the Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, subject only but crucially to, to confidence in their soundness, banks extend credit by simply increasing the borrowing customer's current account, which can be paid away to wherever the borrower wants by the bank writing a cheque on itself, which is essentially the creation of this liability. Now, I hope that's clear to everyone because Joseph Schumpeter, who is one of the greatest um, economists I think that ever existed, and he'd be my sort of number one choice if you want to read one of the classics, this book, History of Economic Analysis, 1954, observed back in 1954 that economists found it very difficult to get their heads around uh, this simple concept that when banks create loans, um, they also uh, create deposits. Um, and funnily enough, 57 years later, uh, we still seem to have the same problem. Um, and this is two quotes from the Independent Commission on Banking's um, reports. Uh, the first one, as you can see, banks use the cash that is deposited with them to provide loans to businesses to allow them to undertake productive economic activities. Well, there's a big question about the productive economic activities, as Ben has explained. Um, but the fundamental problem here is that the, the way they're talking about bank lending is, is essentially banks are intermediaries. Another quote in the final report, this is their issues report, banks fund illiquid risky loans with demand deposits. That's a little bit closer to the truth, perhaps. But essentially, uh, there was no mention in the 400-odd page report, the final report that the Independent Commission published, of credit creation, of banks function as credit creators, of their, of their absolutely vital importance as a macroeconomic actor in the economy. Uh, and, and their definition of lending was wrong. This was how uh, myself, Ben and Richard Werner and, uh, and my boss Tony Greenham reacted when uh, <laughs> we went to see the Independent Commission of Banking and tried to explain to them uh, that loans create deposits. Um, basically, they just, they just didn't get it. Um, we, uh, we then wrote to them after the report was published and they told us that there was disagreement amongst the commissioners on the Independent Commission um, about this, uh, whether or not banks created money. So, you know, that's the situation we're in, okay? This is, this is just appalling. These, these are the people that are charged with recreating our banking system and they don't even understand that banks create credit when they make loans. So, the truth on this one, uh, rather than the myth, is that banks create deposits, which can be used um, to make any kind of routine payment, essentially it is money, uh, whenever they expand their balance sheet. So that's a sort of technical sounding term, expanding the balance sheet. What it means is the creation of an asset at the, and a liability at the same time, that, that the process I just explained to you. Okay? And banks expand their balance sheets when they make loans, as I've talked about, which you might call direct uh, credit creation, when they fulfil existing overdrafts. So if you've got an overdraft with your bank and you um, request and you go into that overdraft, the bank essentially creates deposits for you when you go into that overdraft. And again, that is brand new purchasing power. It's, it's money. It's new money that they've created. It hasn't come from anyone else's savings or deposits. It's, it's they've just created it just like that. You could say that's more indirect because it's obviously not for the bank to determine who goes into their overdraft. It's, it's more you or the business or whoever it, it might be. But of course, it's the bank that decides whether or not you get an overdraft. So they are still making a very important macroeconomic decision when they decide to give you an overdraft or not. And of course, the interest rate they offer you is equally important in terms of your likelihood of actually drawing down on that. Um, and the third main way they, they create new money is by buying existing financial assets. Uh, bonds, government bonds typically, uh, buildings, counters, assets, and, and the list goes on. Um, now, 
I want to talk a little, I'm going to talk quickly about this because I think most of you hopefully are already quite familiar with this myth, the myth of the money multiplier. Um, this is the idea that uh, essentially uh, banks are limited by um, the central bank according to the, the, the amount of reserves that, that, that they hold and if there's a reserve ratio, um, in this case it's a 10% reserve ratio, that there's a sort of mathematically finite amount of lending that can go on in the economy. So you start off with £100, uh, the, the, the bank can then, that's deposited and the bank can then use that to, to lend um, 90 with a 10% reserve ratio, holding on to 10, etc, etc. Runs on through the economy, you end up with £900. Another way of presenting this is in this kind of way, you've got these are cycles of lending going along the bottom, the dark green is the so-called base money, central bank reserves, and then the amount of lending upon which you can make, it, it gradually runs out um, over time, the additional lending being the, the grey. So the kind of the easiest way to think about it in some ways is, is it, as this kind of triangle, uh, we have a monetary base and the banks can lend upon that, but, in, but, but gradually their, their lending is, is, is kind of reduced um, over time. And the idea is that that creates some, some kind of stability. Now, the truth of the matter is that, that this is uh, no longer the case. Um, in the UK, uh, as Ben explained, uh, there is no uh, compulsory uh, liquidity reserve ratio uh, de or deposit ratios, as, as it was described. Um, that, that was completely abolished um, in the early 80s. Um, and, you know, th this idea that there's a relationship between central bank reserves and, and actual commercial bank money, um, it, it, there's no evidence for it really at all. And this is a nice example to show that from the book. Um, figure five, this shows the uh, collapse of commercial bank lending, the top chart. Um, these two charts are on exactly the same calendar, by the way. We're starting in uh, June 2000, running up to January 2011. You can see this massive collapse in bank lending. And this is, the, this is bank reserves at the Bank of England, Central Bank Reserves. You see here that they're completely flat with all this high level of credit. There's this collapse. They pump two, 200 billion uh, reserves into the, uh, into the system, into the banks, and um, lending just carries on getting down. So, you know, there's no, there's no relationship there. And the Bank of England, um, you know, Paul Tucker again, basically admits here that base money comprises neither a target nor an instrument of policy. So, this is what it, it really... Is, is this a better way of thinking about that relationship? It's essentially a kind of balloon. The, there's these reserves that are required within the system, which I'll, and I'll explain that in the next couple of slides. They're required for interbank payments. And banks essentially lend on the basis mainly of their confidence, as, as we've discussed. You know, if they think people are going to pay back their loans, or if they've got ways of you know, de-risking the loans through securitization, they'll make loans. You know? and, um, they just need to have enough reserves um, to clear at the, end of, at the end of each day all their payments with other banks. Um, and there's a nice quote here from Charles Goodhart who wrote the foreword to this. Um, the base multiplier model of money, uh, money supply determination is such an incomplete way of describing the process uh, that it amounts to a misinstruction. So, um, banks, as I say, when, 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 when you um, pay some money, uh, into your bank. If you bank at um, if you bank at HSBC and you pay some money to Barclays, it's not actually commercial bank money that created by banks that moves. Effectively, what happens is central bank reserves are moved from um, HSBC to Barclays. Okay, that's the only way banks can settle with each other within the closed loop of the intra-bank um, payment system which is represented in this diagram on page 63 of the, the book. Okay? Central bank reserves are, can only be created by the central bank, and they can only exist within the interbank market, the interbank trading system. We can't get central bank reserves. It's just a different kind of money. It's, it's a money of final settlement within the banking system. Okay? Because a bank, when a bank um, creates new money, as we've seen, it makes a loan, the money itself is a liability, it's an IOU. And banks can't use IOUs 
between it and me or, or it and HSBC and you to settle with other banks. They have to use central bank reserves. That the central bank is the lender of last resort. Its money is the most um, liquid. Uh, it's quite complicated to explain the history of how this came about. Five minutes, okay, we have to speed up. Um, but please read chapter two and you'll find out exactly how it came about. <laughs> but, it, but essentially, um, you've got to, um, the, each bank has to hold enough central bank reserves to um, pay all the other banks in the system. And what they do is you have this interbank market where they um, trade the, the reserves between each other, usually in exchange for government bonds, okay, which are also a very liquid kind of asset. So every day, um, these, government, these, these uh, reserves are swapped between the banks on the interbank market and they charge interest upon them. The LIBOR rate, the interbank interest rate, shot right up during the financial crisis because banks lost confidence in each other's own solvency. Right? They, they stopped believing that if they made a loan of reserves to another bank in the system, that that bank would actually be able to give them back the bonds that they're, they're exchanging in the, in the loan and pay the the interest. So the interest rate shot right up on, on, uh, on reserves, on the repurchase agreements that the banks had between, and the whole system almost came to a complete collapse. And that was the reason the central bank pumped in 200 billion of reserves in quantitative easing, to, to create more liquidity within the system. Okay, so now all the banks are flush with these reserves, but as we've seen, they're still not lending. So despite all of this quantitative easing, it's still not working. Um, now, a, quest a very good question that, that, that we often get asked, and I think Ben was touching on it before, was, um, was asked it before actually, is if banks can create brand new money whenever they want, why do they need our deposits? You know, wh why is it so important? Why are these, these campaigns um, to move your money from you know, HSBC to a credit union or you know, a smaller ethical bank? Well, banks have balance sheets, as I've explained, and this is basically what a ban bank's balance sheet looks like. You've got loans to customers, as I've talked about. You've got reserves at the Bank of England. You've got cash. You've got other financial assets, um, etc. And on the other side, you've got customers' deposits. You've got loans from other financial institutions, including in particular whole, the wholesale markets that, that increasingly European banks became very dependent on. And you've got capital. Okay, And capital includes retained profits from interest, as we discussed uh, issuing shares um, and provisions which they hold to in case some of these loans go bust essentially. They have to hold capital and provisions um, to, to make sure their balance sheets balance. Th these, this balance sheet, total liabilities must equal total assets, okay? They have to e equal each other out. The reason banks like retail deposits is because retail deposits are pretty cheap. Why are they cheap? Well, you've probably noticed if you've got some money in your bank at the moment, you're getting 0.5% or less interest. Um, they're very cheap at the moment, of course, because interest rates are, are very low. But, but, but as a general rule, they're quite a bit cheaper than other forms of, of funds, such as um, loans from wholesale markets, for example, which suddenly sh became very, very expensive when the subprime mortgage uh, crisis erupted. So that's why banks um, need deposits they don't need them to make loans. They need them in order that their balance sheet can, can balance over time. Um, myth number three, I'm going to speed up a bit now, um, that, that the Bank of England can directly affect credit creation through changing interest rates. Well, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. You can see there's massive collapse, in, uh, massive reduction in interest rates at the time of the financial crisis. Um, this shows what happened to, to lending to SMEs. It carried on going down, um, it, you know, it does, if, if a bank doesn't have confidence in the economy, if it doesn't have confidence in its own balance sheet, it's going to stop lending, it's going to try and rebuild, it's going to deleverage itself. Um, credit allocation is, is demand driven, you know, you're hearing all these banks constantly saying, you know, we, we'd lend more money into the economy if only the small businesses really wanted the money, but they're scared, they're scared, they're worried, you know, that, that things w will go wrong. I think it's a load of rubbish myself. Um, and, and the Bank of England's come up with lots of data to show that, okay, maybe that, that there's less small businesses applying for loans. But the reason they're not applying for loans is because the, 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 the interest rates are so high, 
or because they, they, they want to hold money back because they think that the bank's going to remove their overdraft, their overdraft facility or put up interest rates on their overdraft facility. So, of course, they're, they're not applying for loans. It, credit is driven by banks. It's rationed by banks. And some of the best economists in the world have um, worked on this stuff, including Joseph Stiglitz. Um, this is another quote from Mr. Tucker. He's my favourite man at the Bank of England. It's just explaining how this system works. It's an information asymmetry, essentially, which economists don't like. They like the idea that everybody's got perfect information so that the bank knows exactly what the risk is of this business or, or that person. But as Ben explained, basically, for a bank, it's a much less risky loan to loan against a house where they can get the collateral if the loan goes wrong than it is to lend to a, a small businessman who's got limited liability. If the loan goes wrong, the bank's you know, shafted. It's not going to get the money back. Okay? So, of course, it's incentivized to, to lend towards um, capital, to, towards property, and it's incentivized to, to lend into financial speculation because the short-term returns are much faster. Um, and Ben's talked about this, you know, let's, let's go for the much happier going for the, uh, the mortgages and the, and the consumer loans and the commodity speculation than the, the small businesses. Uh, this is just a sharp chart from the book showing um, uh, what Ben was talking about. This is his 8% going into the uh, productive sector. You'll see this massive growth in um, secured lending to individuals. Um, that's the, this kind of green here. Uh, that's basically mortgages. Um, and you, you see all this uh, financial intermediation, it's, it's, it's called. Um, and, and you'll see this massive growth since 97 in this, in this kind of speculative lending activity. I think Jasper, it was, is right that some of that money that goes into mortgages and consumption does find its way back into the real economy. But the broad pattern is a move away from productive lending towards speculative and consumptive lending. Uh, OK, final myth. Um, if we start trying to control credit, we're, we'll, we'll sort of turn into some sort of communist regime. Uh, these are the words that were used by a, a guy who we went to talk to at the Treasury uh, when we started talking about credit, credit controls. I uh, went there with Richard, who was talking about uh, the history of credit controls. And he basically said, uh, well, you know, that's communist, isn't it? We, we can't do that. We can't turn into a communist country. This, is a, this system is so recent, so historically recent. It's only been around for 30 years. Before then, it was quite normal for governments to um, have systemic controls on different types of bank credit creation, which sectors it went into, how much credit was created. These are all the examples. I think we showed this slide last year. Um, and I think that, that, that people are waking up to this, including the establishment, including the, the few financial journalists uh, like Martin Wolf, who do get this point, and, and John Kay, and you can see that from these quotes. John Kay says, a suitable requirement might be that high proportion, 90% of retail bank's assets uh, be in these kinds of um, areas. Uh, quote there from Adir Turner. Uh, he's talking about uh, leverage ratios, differential leverage ratios for different kinds of lending. Um, and Martin Wolf there finally talking about the government uh, directly creating money. Um, and I just want to make one final point before I finish, uh, which is about the debt crisis and how this all ties into it, the global debt crisis. It's very important to understand that when a government that's already in debt, as virtually every government is, um, makes, uh, uh, spends money into the economy, it issues bonds. Okay? That's the only way it can do that. And those bonds are bought by the private sector. Okay? The private sector could spend that money on something else. It could invest that money in productive business activity. Okay, so you have this kind of crowding out effect when the government spends money. Now, there's a big debate about you know, whether or not the government spending money could be more effective in terms of the multiplier effect into the wider economy or not. And we don't need to get into that here. But the fundamental point is that governments do not create new purchasing power through issuing bonds. They can only create new purchasing power if they directly put money into circulation in the way that Ben's reforms are talking about. So, you know, it's just a very simple step. If we're going to do nothing else, governments should stop issuing bonds and borrow directly from these banks. 
that are so that, that who have these horrific balance sheets. They'd like nothing more than the government to borrow from them because the government's the, the, the least risky debtor you can you can possibly get. That would create brand new purchasing power in the economy. The government can spend it on whatever they want, you know, infrastructure, transport, building houses, loans to small businesses, or, or make loans, you know, or, or buy debt from small businesses directly. Um, so I just wanted to, to finish on that, on that kind of point. And just say, keep up the pressure, as I, as I said, you know, get out there, lobby your MPs, we'll send them the, the book, get down to St Paul's, educate the, the people down there. I don't think many people down there know, know what we're talking about. Um, and let's keep going. Thank you very much. Thanks, man.